We have about uh, half an hour for Q and A from the floor, so let me um, let me open it up. So thank you. Uh, it's always hard being on the last panel of the last day, I know from personal experience, but that was a wonderful uh, dose of harsh reality. So here I have a harsh reality type question. So I've been involved in preparedness and we spent a lot of money in this country being prepared for a number of uh, events. We spent billions of dollars, ladies and gentlemen, on preparedness in this country down to the states and, and local governments. And we do have an index, you can see it on the web, that talks about the preparedness uh, by this index at these uh, county and state levels. What the index doesn't tell you is what the impact of such preparedness would be in terms of cases averted and lives saved. So here's the question to the panel. How do you know when you've got enough preparedness? Are we done yet is the question often asked me. And I said, I don't know. How would you know when we've done enough preparedness. We've got a lot of challenges. Hans, you're right. But you know, how much do we do before we say, yeah, it's good enough. Let's go. Why, why is everybody looking at me? You know? <laughs> 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 no, I want George also to answer this one. Yeah, me, me too. Uh, no, but let me start. No, you're right. We, we will never know. I mean, that's the issue. And why don't we, we never know? Because, the, as we said yesterday, it's an unknown thing what it actually will be. So what are we preparing for? Uh, and, and there you have to do some uh, kind of projections and, and, uh, and uh, analyzes how to do it. But you can never be 100% sure that you have the full preparedness. But that's not an excuse to not do anything or very little. But, but you have a very good point. OK, my, my comments were that. You remember Gordon mentioned this morning about you know, sometimes in China we sort of overreacted. So that's the problem. So you, you know, while you are talking about preparedness, how do you know, you, you know it's prepared well? Or how do you know it's really overreacted? So I think there's no standard. I think the standard is the outcome. As long as you get the disease controlled. Good example, I don't want to expand it too further, but for the MERS, for example, single case, single imported case in China. So how much money we spent for that case? You know, try to trace back all those close contacts. You know, we rotate for all those um, uh, doctors and the nurses for a single uh, uh, case and, uh, you know, in a uh, modified uh, P, uh, P3 hospital. So, you know, uh, I, I would say, you know, it's very difficult to see when and where you really reach the standard for the preparedness. For preparedness. So only when you, you know that disease is well controlled. So I think this is the problem. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking I might have got out of that one. Um, I, I think the question for me would be in, in the settings that we're talking about, given the, the challenges that Hans raised with being so far from the IHR core capabilities, is there seriously a developing country in the world that we think has too much preparedness? And um, So I, I think in the first instance, drive on towards those IHR core capabilities and I will defer to our colleagues at WHO to, to revise the IHR if we're starting to see that countries are overprepared. Uh, Sanjana Kazi from the United Nations. I just want to probe a little bit more on that question you asked uh, as moderator to, um, uh, to WHO on IHR compliance and donors uh, incentive, and but switch that question to Diffid who's sitting um, at the table um, to see what, what, what are the perspect what, what is the perspective of a donor in, in, uh, in, in providing incentives, financial or otherwise, um, to countries uh, to have better compliance to IHR? I think it's a good question, and um, I'll apologize up front. I'm not, I'm not sure I've got a good answer to it, but I think it's uh, an important discussion to open up. And it, it's something we're all grappling with. I and mean, we've got the IHR there, as we've, as we've clearly discussed. We've got the technical framework. We're all signed up. We believe in it. Um, 
there is, again, as, as Hans said, there's the political challenge as well as the capacity and the financial challenge for, for implementation. Um, I think that the question around how do you incentivize countries to, it's, it's incentivizing countries to come along and then it's, um, I think the question for me is how do you address the issues where countries just clearly aren't taking it seriously? And, and I'm not sure we've got the answers yet. It, it's something that we want to, to get into more. Um, I don't know if that's something, I'll be very cheeky and turn it back and say I don't know if it's something that the high level panel can maybe start to look at in terms of preparedness for emergency response. But I, I do think, in, in, this, in that's meant a constructive spirit, I think it's something we all need to have the conversation around. Um, and involving, involving countries in that. I, the one thing that makes me a little bit nervous in this is that sometimes it becomes a little bit too carrot and stick and we, st we almost start talking about doing the IHR to countries. And I don't think that's going to be helpful. It's got to be how do we work in partnership to strengthen health systems so that everyone sees it as a, as a mutual interest to bring those capacities up and to have the strong health, health systems in place that can protect us all. And the important aspect that uh, uh, Dr. Go <coughs> mentioned. So, we it took nine months before, before from this, from we started our investment, and with a tremendous uh, job by WHO and, more, and the say, uh, Doctors Without Borders and so on, to to uh, make it a success in nine months. So now we can go back and see, could we have done better? And the answer is yes, we could have done better. And I would just mention one thing. If we had developed standard protocols for this kind of testing and passed them ethical review, that would have probably shortened the time by one month. If the emergency had been announced in June instead of August, probably another couple of months, uh, and uh, if we had completed phase one trials so that we were ready to actually to move into the efficacy trials, we could have probably saved another two months. And by that, we would have completed the trial before Christmas in the uh, end of 2014. Uh, and that would have been then it could have had an impact on the tail end of the of the epidemic and it would have been also shortened because it was more cases at that time so you would have more rapidly reached conclusion but i think this is a fundamental issue that we now need to carefully think through how we can actually shorten the time and be ready for the efficacy trials so that they can be completed within the time of an outbreak. <laughs> Thanks, I did. Well, my question was partially asked on Priya Basu from the World Bank. My question was partially asked by Sanjana, but I'd like to address that question to WHO, actually. Um, this is something that's kind of topmost uh, um, on, on our minds as we design this pandemic facility, and one of the the, um, the, the hypotheses that we're working on is that you know, the benefit of this facility is that financing can be used as a tool to incentivize countries to become much better prepared for the next pandemic. Would you agree with that hypothesis? Just to get your views on that from, from, from WHO. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, and, and not no, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. I, I, as I said, some, I mean, there, there are two aspects on, on uh, the preparedness here and with IHR and so on. One is the technical part and one is the financial part. And for countries, uh, there are both issues. It is that they might lack the, both the, the technical capacity to do it as well as the financial. So it's not just money. It's not just to put the money there and then you can do it. It's, it's uh, but as, as Richard is right to say, it's not for an external one to put it in place. But it is to provide that support, both the technical and financial. And as you said, if you, if you put up the financial 
resources, it's of course an incentive for, for the countries to do it. But what I also think we need to do, and I think Richard was absolutely right, is that we maybe try to overdo it. I mean, the IHR is a, is, is a, is a good uh, approach how we do it, but maybe it's an overkill sometime. And I worked before I, I came back to headquarters, I worked in the Western Pacific region. And if you look, for example, on the Pacific Island countries, I mean, it's unrealistic that every one of them should have the laboratory capacity or whatever. We also need to see it, uh, how countries can collaborate on this issue. And, and countries like Australia and so on are then, and New Zealand are then interested to see how they can provide that uh, support within the IHR uh, framework. But, but uh, uh, a short answer to your question, yeah, I think so. I think the financial incentive is important. I think the only, only thing I'd add to that, and, and partly adding to the earlier question as well, is that there is a task for us all, I think, in strengthening the investment case um, for preparedness, both in terms of the financial investment case and really sort of political investment case. So helping to bring, uh, and it's, it's something we've touched on a lot over the last couple of days, is how we can help as a community ourselves, bring ourselves along, but also bring along um, our country counterparts, and particularly in ministers of finance and, and upwards in, in offices of presidents and prime ministers, into understanding why it's important and why it's in their interests. And I, I think it's something that maybe in the broader health sector, we. And again, as we've alluded to, we haven't always won that battle in, in helping have a sensible conversation with ministries of finance and making the investment case for health system strengthening. But in this one, there's, there's such a huge downside if, if they don't do it. And Ebola, we've got this real moment of opportunity post Ebola that maybe it's something we can really drive home, but it's going to need a really clear core script around it that we can get agreed between us really quickly and, and start driving over, over the key international moments over the next 12 months. Um, Anne-Marie Kimball from Chatham House. I'm really confused, and, and I'm just going to ask for some information uh, about the IHR implementation, because I've been to the website and looked at all the annexes from the, uh, annexes from the executive uh, meetings, etc. Uh, it's very hard to find a tally of exactly which countries are fully implemented and which countries are not. The map is 75% to 100% is, is the green zones, if you will. And it's by IHR core capacity. So it's really hard to do any analytics outside of, uh, outside of WHO. So uh, bear with me if I just ask a couple questions. If you have um, 48 countries where there's no information on IHR implementation that comes back to headquarters, do any of those countries have a WR? Um, just a question. I know um, the regional offices report, I know AFRA reported in November of 2013 that no country in Africa, in fact, had IHR core capacity implementation. And, um, and I'm, I'm, so I'm curious, I don't understand the, the zero <laughs> there. Um, and I guess in terms of does the IHR work, it would be really interesting to know, of those countries where IHR is implemented, is there any demonstrable decrease in the need for international assistance for epidemic control through GORN or other WHO offices? Can it be demonstrated um, that there is that efficacy, or were these always very wealthy countries that never needed that anyway? I mean, these are all different questions that one could analyze. Um, and really show the value. And finally, in WTO, it wouldn't take every country going forward with a dispute resolution under SPS to say, I'm sorry, there's a non-tariff trade barrier that's been put in place. You know that health concerns are, in fact, the largest cause of embargoes under SPS. Um, that's been published. And it's actually free on the WTO site. You can see uh, what the causes are through the urgent measures. Uh, within the WTO system. The question I have is, if you did one case where a country said, you know, we had a treaty, you signed the treaty, and yet you violated the treaty in putting this embargo in your importation against me, if only one case were successful through dispute resolution, I don't think you'd have the problem again. Anyway, that's just my hypothesis. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, I'll try to respond to some, even if IHR is not directly under my, my responsibility. But as I, when it was in the Western Pacific region, it actually was. But I'll, I'll try to, to respond to it. Yes, we have uh, the statistics, and we have, and we're doing uh, analysis. They might not all be uh, in a public domain. Uh, I, I can't answer that, how, how they deal with that. It's, it's KG Fukuda, actually, who's, who's in charge of it. But uh, yes, some of the countries that are not reporting are, are having WRs. And those WRs are following up with, with, uh, with uh, governments and Ministry of Health. They are. They're, that's part of it. But they still don't get a response. Um, and we can't enforce it. I mean, it's about sovereignty. I mean, they're there and, 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 and member state who decides what they want to do. So it is a problem. What we also have to see is where we sometimes get a bit confused is because it's usually not that you haven't, you might not report anything, but it's usually when they report they have uh, fulfilled some of the core capacities, they have some of the core capacities, capacities but not others. So it's partially uh, fulfilled and that and, and um, uh, so that's sometimes that they have 20 percent and then they're increasing 40 50 percent it's mainly the wealthy countries but there are some other countries also with less resources that have been able to to do it I can't give you an example but I, I know that from the Western Pacific region um, that there were some countries on on the WTO and so on the problem is what kind of sanctions are you going to, to do with? And, and I'm not sure that one case will be uh, sufficient. If you look at the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, where we have had issues, even if you had shown that a country has not fulfilled to it, still it hasn't have changed, changed things. I, I think as long as we can't have sanctions, as how and how and what kind of sanctions would we have Let's, let's just take the example now of the 40 countries. We could take the 40 countries that actually, and maybe there are even representatives here in the room, I don't know, uh, that, that uh, impose those um, uh, restrictions. What kind of sanctions should we uh, then try to enforce? I, I think that's an issue. I would be there very happy if we could, but WHO can't because we are a member state organization and we don't have that kind of authority over the others. I think that needs a completely different um, um, uh, 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 mechanism uh, or arrangement, and, and I don't have the answer to it. Um, and I, I'm not sure it's enough to name and shame either. Um, uh, very quickly, um, what are the lessons one can learn from the climate change community and lobby, which you think would help uh, 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 place and sustain pandemic preparedness squarely on the global arena and countries' agenda? Um, it's, it's not an area I know well, but I, I think it was really interesting hearing Simon Young speak yesterday about um, ARC and the experience there. And I don't know about the wider climate change lobby so much and, and the role of civil society in the lobby in, in getting to that place, but seeing, hearing that experience where you've now had, I think, nine countries taking up that facility, really investing in preparedness, I would link that back to the sorts of evidence that I, I was talking about earlier and was asked to speak about around really making the case for investments in preparedness, um, in, in that case for drought resilience and, and um, improved humanitarian response. I think if we can get similar evidence promulgated um, for um, pandemics and then sort of really build on that and start looking and saying not only you've got the evidence there but we've got potential answers there, maybe we can start building building those coalitions. But I must say, I don't know enough of the detail of the climate change lobby. Perhaps do you think there are any lessons you'd like to, to suggest to us? Um, no, but uh, I'm, I am uh, just observing that uh, globally there is uh, 
a strong mobilization around uh, uh, climate change uh, for, for the right reason, don't get me wrong, but I'm just, there are many other issues which would, you know, request, which require global attention, which are, which are not like pandemic preparedness, for example. So I was wondering, what's the difference? I, I, I understand the difference in the type of topics, that's not the issue, but why is it that, you know, there is some, so, so much success in mounting uh, such visibility on this topic that, uh, for example, at, at, at the bank, we have established a, a vice presidency on this, and then you have that big conference in Paris being planned, and, you know, there is action, and uh, last year at the UN Assembly, it, I think I'm trying to understand the, the, clim the climate, around this? I mean, if I might, because as, as, as Olga mentioned, I, I've been working in, in both of these communities to some extent. I mean, there may partly be a problem uh, or, or an issue in terms of the assumption or premise that you have, because you will find a great many well-informed uh, uh, commentators arguing that what's being achieved on climate change is far below what's needed, uh, and that these are also facing the same underlying sets of issues in terms of global public goods that have to be provided under conditions of very significant uncertainty. But anyway, that's that's enough for me. Um, let's let's take one more uh, question. Uh, let's start at the back there. So, um, so from from Lion's Head, I I just wanted to comment on this this point of how do you um, react to countries and and how countries will. Um, you know, partners will react if, if, there's, a, if there's an infection in, 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 a, in another country. Um, I, I would sort of take it back to David Nabarro's uh, points of saying you cannot um, legislate against these things. You cannot, um, uh, you, you cannot uh, assume that people will play by the rules. Um, if there is a, uh, a, a bad infection in one country, other countries will tear up the rule books uh, by definition. So what you have to do is say to countries, this is going to happen. If you have a pandemic, it will be bad for you. I mean, if you have one of these infections, but if you do nothing about it, it will be worse. That you can't say you will be insulated from, from uh, you know, big, significant financial loss. But you've got to get them to feel, and I think China shows this with, with MERS. Um, the effect of SARS, the community now says it's in our self-interest to make the sacrifices, to pay the prices, to, um, to ensure that we jump on top of this very, very quickly in the future. So, so it's a mistake to say you can insulate people. You've, you've just got to say, if you, don't, if you don't act quickly, you think this is bad, the, the, the alternative is so, so much worse. That's the only way you'll incentivize people. No, I, I agree what you're saying. But I mean, thinking about it, both what we have discussed uh, yesterday and today, and also your question about the environmental movement and well, why we're not doing it, I think we're missing one thing here. I mean, we, we're shying away from the one who is actually the one who will decide and take the final action and that's the politicians. We can sit here as public health specialists, we can sit here as uh, economists, and, and we can agree and say this is a very important investment. If you don't have the political establishment with you, you will fail. We saw that in the surrounding countries with Ebola, when you could mobilize the president or the prime minister action was really taken. But, and, and I think George, you mentioned that too, how important it is to get, and, and we have a tendency to forget it because we think we're right, so they should understand that. But they unfortunately don't always do that. And in, environment, in the environmental area, you really have mobilized a lot of political interest and political will. I don't think we have done that really in public health, to be honest. And I think that's maybe, uh, and, and hopefully, the, the next um, workshop here, I understand, will be on governance in, in London. 
that issue. But the risk is we fall back to that at that governance meeting, how many p really politicians will we have there? I mean, we'll probably have the, the no, not that many. And maybe they are the key people to change things. Can I just make uh, some more comment about this? You know, what happened with the H7N9? From the very beginning, you know, like 48 hours, we already know that H7N9 is from the live poultry market. But it lasts for almost a year to stop the live poultry market in China. Only when it was realized by the, you know, the politicians or the top leaders realized, okay, this is a problem, and the local, government, local um, leaders realized this is a problem, okay, stop the live poultry markets, you know, it's so clear. So that, that's a very good example. The leadership or politicians, you know, they play a more important role than here we are discussing. <laughs> Elizabeth Emanuel, Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. I wanted to come back to one point on um, preparedness and climate change. And over the two days, um, there was, I think that there is a possibility to link, for example, climate change financing, where we have quite a bit of resources, and human health. And maybe it may be a particular area that the committee would want to look at because some of the health impacts of climate change may have or may, may relate to pandemics. For example, we saw what happened in South, South Central and the Caribbean with respect to chick fee last year and in some countries in the Caribbean the rise of the, the chick fee virus happened at the end of a drought and the beginning of some very intense rains. Um, so, so just looking at, I mean, a suggestion, looking at how we relate the, the bulk of monies on the climate change financing and how we could get, how, how we link human health impacts with climate change and the requirements for preparedness in the health sector. And certainly what we find is that how do we choose winners and losers among sectors? So you have monies for tourism under, under climate change adaptation, you have health and so on, but there is a strong focus on the climate <coughs> side on things like sea level rise, et cetera, but not as much focus on maybe areas related to uh, malaria in some countries leptospirosis, et cetera, et cetera, that, 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 that is re-emerging. So these may be issues that, that you would want to look at. Caribbean has to